Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Chris Paxson. We're delighted you could all make it for this, this uh, I, what I think will be a really interesting discussion. We're calling this Get a Financial Life. And I'm here with Julio Reyes, who is the director of the UFLY Center, and I'll be introducing our guest in just a minute. I, I think the preface is when students are at Brown, they're thinking a lot about their life at Brown, and that's what you should be doing, and thinking about navigating classes and, and social activities and everything else that you do. But these concerns about what happens afterwards with your financial life seem much more distant. And our speaker is somebody who's really spent a lot of time thinking about how young people especially should navigate finances, think about planning, uh, and, and you know, get, get a good start once they leave college. So she is Beth Kobliner. She's an expert on personal finance, and she's a former staff writer at Money Magazine. She's authored two New York Times bestsellers, Make Your Kid a Money Genius, Even If You're Not, and Get a Financial Life, Personal Finance in Your 20s and 30s. So Beth was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve on his advisory council on financial capability and did some great work there and spearheaded the council's moneyasyougrow.org platform. And of course, one of the reasons why she's here is that she's a very devoted Brunonian. She is a member of the President's Leadership Council. She's a Brown alumna from the class of 1986. So before we get started, this is what we're going to do. We're going to show a brief video clip, and then Julia and I will have a discussion with Beth for a little bit, and then we'll open up the floor for Q&A. So again, thanks for coming, and let's, let's do the video. Thanks. What's the best thing that you could spend your money on? Uh huh. <laughs> you know what money is. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I have a lot of money in my boot. In money? your room? No, in my boot. In your boot? It's like a piggy bank, except it's a boot. Oh. So I will put my money in this. Okay. High five for that. We'll begin with just, you know, what prize do you want? Mm -hmm. The big glasses. That'll be eight tickets, please. I don't have enough. We have a situation. I could give you the glasses if you choose to take out a loan. That means I'm going to lend you two tickets, but then you have to come back to my house next week with nine tickets. Here to explain more about that is New York Times bestselling author Beth Kobliner. Hi, guys. Kate's offer may sound great, but be careful when you borrow. It can cost you lots of extra tickets come payback time. See you later. What do you want to be when you grow up? <gasps> Everyone's got an idea. I what do you think? I want to be a meteorologist. TV or radio, what do you think? I want TV. She wants to be on camera. One of my friends, when she grows up, she wants to be a gadgetator. Do you know how little mommy birds, they swallow the food first and then they give some to their babies? Mm -hmm. That's what my friend wants to do when she grows up. She wants to be a gadgetator. I wonder if that's a BFA or just a BA. What is a credit card? Oh, it spends money. You really slide it in this yeah. machine when you buy That's stuff. You hold it with your two fingers and whoop, like this. Whoop. No, like that. No, like this. Whoop. No, like this. Whoop. We want to get pizza. I know you want to get pizza. We will have pizza so soon. We just have to talk about one thing. Would you rather eat one bite of pizza now or a whole slice later. Before you answer, here is Beth Kobliner. Waiting is an important skill. When you wait, you can save up for something you really want, like a slice of pizza. I wanted my pizza now. Did you guys learn anything? No. I did. Yeah. I did. What did you learn, Justine? I learned that money's important. Wait, actually? I learned that money is important too. I learned that money is actually very good to spend on stuff. Spend. 
They got it. Julio. Um, so I actually did graduate from Brown as well in 2012. Um, so before we start talking about financial literacy and stuff, I just wanted to get to know you a little bit better. Okay. Um, so why don't you tell me more about kind of your experience at Brown and then how you ended up um, in your current career and what that trajectory and journey was like. Right. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming. I'm feeling a little weepy <laughs> because I graduated in 1986, which is 30 three years ago. <laughs> and it's so strange, because I walk around, I'm like, this used to be the post office. We'd get letters. <laughs> We'd open the post office. It was a very different, different time. Um, but it feels like the Brown ethos is alive and well. Um, and I'm so honored to be here. Um, I'm pinching myself. I'm here with President Paxson, who I have to say is incredibly authentic and caring. And I really, you know, got, felt getting to know you has been sort of a remarkable experience for me. Um, and you really encapsulate the Brown ethos. Um, and Julio, um, <laughs> who to me, I mean, you might as well be like a senior. You look to me like a kid. But, <laughs> but um, I, I'm particularly honored. And I think this topic is so important, obviously, to me in my career. But just to start off, I was an English major at Brown. So I took one econ class. It was called Econ 1. Do they still have Econ 1? It was called Econ for Poets. I don't want Christine they to hear that, but. <laughs> nope, nope. But it, I loved the class, but I wasn't particularly, you know, I, want, I loved English, I loved literature, I took a lot of theater classes, and I took a lot of art history, and I really explored liberal arts. But I was a middle class girl from Queens. And uh, I needed to work in my summers. And uh, so I wanted to find a job, but my parents didn't have contacts. And my dad um, had an idea to look through the Brown Alumni Monthly magazine, which all of your parents still get. And he circled in red any job in New York City that sounded something like something I'd be interested in. So somebody in pub, uh, one was, it wasn't jobs though, it was like an alum who worked in publishing wrote a little note saying, oh, I'm working on a book or someone who worked in advertising. Mm -hmm. And that was how I got to meet um, <coughs> different people, I had different summer jobs. I worked at a consulting firm, I worked at um, a publishing company. And my final experience was a man named Joel Davis, who's a, a Brown alum. Uh, contacted me and they said, I represent this woman, Sylvia Porter, who's the first person, certainly the first woman, to write about personal finance, meaning how to save, how to get out of debt, how to spend money wisely. And I was an English major. I knew nothing about that. But I took the job and I was her research associate. And my English major skills taught me how to research, how to communicate, how to express yourself. So I kind of learned on the job. So to me, the big takeaway for me um, is I just wanted to make say this, that your major, your concentration is not necessarily what your life will be or has to be, and to be really open in the journey of Brown, because it's such an amazing opportunity to take all kinds of classes. Um, and I feel like, I mean, I, I can't believe it. It's been 33 years, um, but it's, it's certainly shaped my life. Thank you. OK, so let's talk about finance. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. I, and you, you really do, you've taken what you've learned at Brown and, and done such great things with it. So it's, and, and the public service piece, I would emphasize, too, I think is really important. And I know that means a lot to you. So what three financial moves should students make while they're in college? Now, if you're seniors, it's a little late to benefit from this advice, but we're going to get to after college yeah. later, they right? Yeah, they still have a few more weeks. I, yeah, could, okay. I could get you seniors up and running. <laughs> um, 
first of all, the best piece of advice, and it's going to sound like a cliche, but it's not, is graduating from college. Because research shows that people who graduate from college earn, on average, a million dollars more over their lifetime than people who don't graduate from college. So that's a little statistic to keep in mind. Um, so I want to go through th three things. The first is steer clear of credit card debt. Um, how many people have credit cards? A show of hands. Oh, quite a few. Interesting. So. Um, it's fine to have a credit card, but you want to pay off that balance in full every month. A lot of people, a lot of adults I've met throughout my years writing about this topic don't realize that a credit card is like a loan. So when you use a credit card, you're borrowing money, and if you don't pay it back immediately, you'll be charged interest. And it's usually an obnoxiously high interest rate of 18%, which is basically if you buy a computer for $1,000, and you put it on a credit card and only make those minimum monthly payments, it'll take you eight years, and that $1,000 computer costs you $2,000. So the interest builds up really quickly, and that's why you want to be really careful and only use a credit card for something you can afford now and then pay it off immediately. Um, the next point, so that's credit cards, and then the other thing is, point one is don't get into credit card debt. Point two is save if you can. College is obviously not a time for you to be, you know, stashing away all the savings you have. You're, you're focusing on school, which is your job right now. But if you have a job and you're working, um, you can open an, an online savings account. They pay about 2.5%, much, much more than brick and mortar banks. Um, and it's just a good place to put your money. You can find um, high interest rate savings accounts at depositaccounts.com. They just have lists of higher rate savings accounts. And the third point I just wanted to bring up is know what you owe. I think a lot of students have student loans. Now the Brown Promise has kicked in, which will be reducing the amount of loans on average that students have, but you still might have student loans. Um, and I wanted to make it clear, stick with Stafford student loans, try to avoid private student loans, because Staffords have a lower interest rate, 5%. Um, and um, you also have better repayment plans. Um, and to find out if you, I, I, I remember, because I had a, when I graduated from Brown, I had $10,000 in student loans, which at the time was a lot. Um, adjusted for inflation, any economics majors here? What is that? No. <laughs> it's like $20,000. So basically I had, you know, the equivalent of $20,000 in student loans. Um, and the repayment plans you have from federal student loans um, are very helpful um, and you want to look into it and to find out what you owe and, to, and who you have to pay it to, go to studentaid.gov. Yeah. And that way you can sort of, sort of see where you are. Because even though you don't have to start paying it back until six months after graduation, it's good to know what you owe um, and so you, you keep it in your mind. So those are my three so, points. So, so then you graduate. <laughs> so yes. then you graduate. And you know what you owe. You don't have credit card debt. And then next. OK, next. so health insurance, that's the big one. Um, and well, actually, the even bigger one is move back with your parents if you can for a year. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I always get mixed reactions on that. Some people are like, ah. Um, if you can, moving back with your parents, I did that for a year. I okay. saved a lot of money. Um, and I was able to actually just take my savings and pay off that $10,000 in student loans over the year. Um, so if you can live at home, that's great. Get health insurance. Um, under Obamacare, you are allowed to be covered under your parents' plan up until age 26. Um, some states, it's up to uh, 29 or 30. Um, hopefully, that will stay the case, because the current administration has been talking about changes to that. Um, or, if you, the mo way most people get their health insurance is through an employer. An employer will offer you a health insurance plan. But it sounds, you know, when you're young, you feel like, I remember being young and having friends, and I was starting to write about personal finance, and I'd bug my friends in their 20s to get <laughs> health insurance, and they're like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fine, I'm healthy. But the, the issue is, if you get sick or if you had an emergency, it will not only bankrupt you if you have to have big medical bills, but also your family. So that's why health insurance is important. Two is um, put
put your savings and your bill paying on autopilot. And that just means you sign up with your bank and they automatically pay your bills. Um, and that's a great thing to do because it will, you make sure you won't be late, you won't be hit with extra fees. Um, and then savings. If you have a paycheck from a brown job, work steady, you can have it directly siphoned, you know, directly from uh, your job into this, what I talked about before, the online higher interest rate savings account. And that way you know you'll always have a little bit money, you can have 10% go towards savings. And the final point, and this one is gonna really make you all fall asleep during a brown bag lunch, is you want to open a retirement plan. Now the last thing on your mind is retirement. Uh, you're all <laughs> like you're in the middle of, you know, taking classes and learning, and you, but here's the thing. They call them retirement plans. When you go to a job, you have something called a 401k or a 403b, or an individual, or you can get one on your own called an individual retirement account or IRA. And if you don't remember anything from my talk, just listen to this one point. When you start that first job, you want to go in and sign up for the most you can put into your 401k plan at work. And if you don't have a 401k plan at work, open this Roth IRA. And the reason is they're called retirement plans, but they're really super smart savings plans. And they allow your money to grow free from tax. And when money grows free from tax, it grows exponentially quickly. Um, I have to be careful, Chris. Uh, uh, President fast. Paxson is an <laughs> economist. It grows very fast. And so here's an example. I was going to use you too, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So let's start, let's start with Julio. Let's pretend. When Julio turned 20, he said, oh, I'm going to save $1,000 a year because in my retirement plan. Mm -hmm. And he saved every year. And then when he turned 30, he stopped. And he said, I'm just going to let it sit here and grow. So he saved $1,000 a year from 20 to 30 and stopped. Christine partied in her 20s. <laughs> and, then <laughs> and then when she hit 30, she said, oh no, I have to start saving for my retirement. So she started saving $1,000 a year in her 30s, 40s, 50s, all the way up to 65. So she saved 35 years, but didn't start till she was 30. And he saved 10 years from 20 to 30 and then stopped. So the question is, who has more at retirement? Christine, who, Chris, who partied in her 20s, or Julio, but, but saved for 35 years, or Julio, who saved for the first 10 years, 20 to 30, and then stopped and let it ride and grow? Who has more? Who, th who thinks it's Julio has more? We only hope. Who thinks it's Chris who has more? It's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, the question Smart is, how, how much more? He has $200,000, and you have only $150,000. So the point is that you want to start early, and you want to put what you can. And, and the thing is, when you're in your 20s, you're like, oh, I have so many expenses. Like, just do it. Put, ideally, 10% of your salary into one of these plans. You just put it there. You set it and you forget it, and you don't think about it. And I have to tell you, I mean, like I said, I've been writing about this for, for over 30 years. I have people come over to me in their 60s, and they're like, thank you so much. I read your book when I was young. And I'm like, really? Am I 100 years old? But, <laughs> but they say, you know, I didn't think I could, and I forced myself to do it. And that's what, you know, I have hundreds of thousands of dollars now. So if you remember one thing, it's like that woman talking with her hands who told me to do that when I graduated from college. And that is one thing that you can do to really put yourself on a good <coughs> road to success financially. And, and there are no minimums in what you put into these things, no, right? No, no. You can you often can do put, right. You can, I mean, you can open, um, and in my book, which I think you all have a copy of, I go specifically in how to open them, where to open them, but um, with a, an index fund, an ETF it's called, and you don't have to worry about what that means right now, um, or we can talk about it later if you want, but the point is you can start with as little as $100. So you really, it's just a mindset, and it's not about, you know, I, again, I was an English major. I wasn't about, oh, making my money grow. I was about, you know, it's more how do you live the life you want to live? 
and if you go into the nonprofit world, or you go into teaching, or you go into any field, you want to know that this is something that's taken care of, that I'm really kind of doing something smart for myself and my family. And I think, you know, I have no idea how I got into this field, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, it could have gone any way, depending on what alum called me from Brown. But I'm so, I feel so lucky um, because this changes your life if you just could take care of it. It reduces so much of the stress people have in life, worrying about money all the time. I mm -hmm. mean, and, and I think that I've learned and I've seen how it can, you know, with my parents, my dad was a high, junior high school principal and my mom was a chemistry teacher, then a stay-at-home mom, and they were really good at this and they just were really careful and it kind of allowed them, you know, to help me go to Brown. So, so what about what about credit scores? <laughs> Tell us about credit scores right. and protecting your credit score. Right. I need to write some stuff. So, down. do you know your yeah. credit score? <laughs> I, I do. I do. You do? do? You? Oh, yeah, do you want to share it? Or? I have an A credit score. Oh, yeah. perfect credit score, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. Um, basically, a credit score is. It sort of sounds like that TV show Black Mirror, but everything you do when you pay your bills on time, or if you have, if you live off campus and you have utility bills that you have to pay or even often sometimes paying your rent could go toward a credit score. All that's being monitored by these credit reporting companies. And if you make late payments, they lower your score. And the score range is from like 350 to 800. It's a little like the SATs. And you want a 750 or over for your credit score. Um, and you can check your credit score um, for free at creditkarma.com to see if you have a score. Now, if you haven't had a credit card or paid back a loan or had a car loan, then you probably don't have a credit score yet. Um, but don't think you have to get a credit card freshman year, sophomore year, even junior year. I'm an advocate, actually, for waiting till senior year before you get a credit card. I mean, it's fine if you have one and you're very disciplined about paying it off in full, but I've met freshmen who had a credit card and then they were worrying about exams and their credit card debt and making those payments on time. So, but the credit score is so important because a good credit score of 700 or above means you get better deals, lower cost loans like on car loans. Um, employers, prospective employers can often look, in most states can look at your credit score and say, hmm, this person, they're not so good with finances. You know, maybe I don't want them to be in charge of my administrative staff. Or So you have to realize that. And also, prospective landlords can look at your credit score. So knowing that once you have bills, paying them automatically is really important because that has a big impact on how, what kind of deals you get. And also, uh, it could potentially be jobs or renting an apartment. Um, but the good news is it's pretty easy. Just pay your bills on time. And the best way to do that is setting it on automatic. When you have a bank account and you start getting bills, you have it set it up that every time a bill comes in, the bank pays it for you automatically. And that way, you'll never be late. Um, and it's funny, because that didn't exist <laughs> when <laughs> we were graduating. You're younger than I am, but from, I'm graduating from college. There wasn't an automatic thing, so you'd have to remember, you get your bill, you write a check, you put it in the mail, you put on a stamp. It took a long time for that to happen. Whereas using the automatic bill paying is a great idea. Yeah, I was wondering, do you, can you talk a little bit about the different types of credit maybe that people can like accumulate? Yes, right. So there's you know, a credit card, which I think you can mm -hmm. get senior year. Um, as long as you promise yourself you're gonna pay it off in full each month. And if you pay it off in full each month, you will have a, an excellent credit score. Uh, it may be a car loan. And the big one, of course, are student loans. Because once those student loans, six months after graduation, your federal student loans kick in. If somebody has private student loans, those can kick in while you're still in school. But you have to, again, set it automatically, pay those student loans, because the benefit is if you have student loans, you're building your credit score. That's excellent, as long as you don't miss a payment. Because even one missed payment could drop your credit score by 100 points. So suddenly you go from an 800A to a you know, B, um, and there's no SNC in the credit <laughs> scoring world. Um, <laughs> little brown joke there. <laughs> but um, so, so 
those are the ways you can build up your credit score. Some credit scores look at your utilities, if you're paying your electric bill or uh, your phone. You know, you want to make sure to be on time for all those bills because um, that is what goes into your credit score. Yeah, I remember um, when I was relocating back to Providence um, for this job, um, I had to open up a bunch of accounts for different things, and I actually got a free sound bar um, just oh. for signing up for cable. Oh. It was amazing, $200 <laughs> purchase, free. Um, Excellent. Yeah, I so I tip down. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask about. Um, I remember when I was graduating from 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 Brown and leaving, and being really worried about um, building up my credit, but also wanting to save money, um, but also thinking about the different expenses I would have and how I would spend money. Mm. So I'm wondering if you have any um, suggestions or just general thoughts around like spending, right, and the different pressures we encounter with that. Right. Including I, peer pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really yeah. Cool. I remember, so this morning I got up early. I couldn't sleep last night. I was just so excited. <laughs> and then I w walked up Thayer Street. Um, oh, and I'm wearing the earrings that I bought in 1984, everyone, on Thayer Street. Um, <laughs> and I remember, because I was so frugal, because I was on financial aid, and it was hard for my family. And you know, they, so I was like, I can't. And I remember the peer pressure of I had friends, um, and one of my, my freshman roommate, who's still one of my best friends, I'm going to just say, she was from Beverly Hills, California. So I'm like, I'm from Queens. And she's like, I'm from Beverly Hills. She was great, though. But I was a little, <laughs> like, a little wary of that. Um, but, you know, kids who had more money and they would go out, they don't have Big Alice's ice cream anymore. So that was a great place. But I see you have, like, a Froyo place and you have Starbucks and all those little expenses both add up. So you want to be careful, go to the ratty, get your coffee for free, you know, go to the, and I never ate out. And actually, I was thinking about it, you know, that freshman 15, that's one thing I, I lost weight my freshman year at Brown. It was fabulous. No, <laughs> but the point was, I remember friends going out and I would just say, you know, I, I can't afford it. I'll meet you after, mm -hmm. or maybe we could just meet, you know, on the green instead, or I'll meet you after. And if you say that to people, I think I think your generation is better at that and more open about that kind of thing and more. Am I right or yeah? I think so. Really great. But I think in general you can say that, and if you say that, you'll also help probably you know half a dozen other of your friends who also don't have the money for mm -hmm. that kind of spending. Um, but I did splur splurge on these. They're probably like six dollars. <laughs> it was if I amortize it over time, that's a pretty good good investment. Pretty good deal. Yeah. <laughs> so, what what advice would you give your senior yourself now? What mistakes did you make? Right. Um, I'd say the biggest mistake I made, and I hope this resonates for you guys, is I just worried too much. I worried about oh. You know, I remember being a senior. I went to the bookstore. There was an independent bookstore near the Brown bookstore. And I went in there, and I got this. I didn't buy it. I just sat there and read it. What color is your parachute, which is like sort of the career Bible for our generation. And I started to cry. I'm like, I don't know what I want to do, you know? And at Brown, there's so many wonderful classes. And, but then you think, well, how does this translate into a career? And my mother said, don't worry about finding a job. The job will find you, which I mean, maybe doesn't make that much sense. But the essence was true. It was you put yourself out there and let, let your journey be. I mean, I don't mean to sound all, you know, all brown, but let your journey be what it is because you never know. You know, I was an English major, and I have a passion for financial literacy. I think you know, financial rights or civil rights. I think it's so important. And I never would have guessed that. So being open and, and, and don't, don't spend the too much time worrying or feeling like, ooh, I have to be a STEM major. I mean, being a STEM major is great. But if don't feel like you have to. Like, your, your story is oh, yeah. <laughs> sort of like, did you want to tell your? Sure, yeah. I, we were sp talking earlier, and I mentioned that I came into Brown thinking I wanted to do biomedical engineering. 
um, didn't do that. <laughs> um, instead, I graduated with concentrations in sociology and Portuguese and Brazilian studies. Highly recommend taking the Portuguese class. Really great here. Um, great department. Um, but yeah, I think I, I was, my initial concerns were, were money, right? So right. the reason why I wanted to buy medical engineering because it was going to be frugal. I knew I would get money from it. I needed to support my family and help with those things. Um, but really, I think the open curriculum allowed me to mm -hmm. kind of explore where my passions were um, and really find um, an academic department where I could speak about my personal experiences but have the language for that, right? And also, um, Google did a study and they said, they looked at their top mm -hmm. performers, Google, and, and they came up with the eight most important criteria of, of a top performer at Google, and dead last was having technical knowledge. Mm. No, it was our ability to work with others, empathy, uh, critical thinking, all those things that you also get from a liberal arts major. Mm -hmm. And now, sort of, there's there more, if you look at, um, there was a study on job ads, and jobs are looking for the, the, the ability to amass a lot of information and explain it to people. So those are the skills. And look, being a computer science major, an engineering major, is absolutely awesome. Um, but if you're an English major or a theater major or a history major, you have so much opportunity. And at Brown, I would say be a liberal arts major, but also take one statistics <laughs> class and one computer science class, because you have SNC. <laughs> I mean, it's really, I, I think it's one of those hard things because I'm you know, 54. But I look back and I think, wow, I really made so much of that experience. And I think, oh, I could have even taken more. But it's the time to explore. And, and it's not a cliche. And it's not a, oh, that's just for people who have money. It really is, you can find your passion and what you're interested in. And, and have it be practical, and have it really be something you could spend your life doing. Um, or you'll change in your careers, too. And all of my friends from Brown had many different experiences. And some of my friends' kids are in the audience. And I feel like I just remember having these long, intense discussions. And one's you know, an art uh, expert, and one's uh, a civil justice, fierce lawyer defending women. And you know, there's so many interesting things. And you never could have guessed what we would be doing. You couldn't figure it out. And certainly wouldn't have thought I'd be doing finance. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our students go to graduate school, as you know. And you know, I hear students talk a lot about, even if they're not leaving Brown with many loans, it's like, how do I save up? Do I go right away? Do I take out loans? Does it make sense? How, how do you think about that? Right. Well, that is a tricky one, and it really, of course, will depend a bit on your, what you're going to grad school in. Um, uh, you know, for STEM majors, getting a PhD or a master's certainly will boost your income and probably open your career opportunities. I turned the page because I have a, there was one study that only half of all English PhDs from the six top schools, only half of them ended up in tenure jobs. So going into you know, getting masters and PhDs and going into lots of debt for them may not be the right equation for many people. And you really have to be hard-nosed. And even law schools now, you know, the average student graduates from law school with $116,000 in debt. And they say, oh, a lawyer. But the market is difficult for lawyers. So you have to go, if you're looking at a grad school, you have to figure out what schools you're looking at, and find out about what the job placement rates are, mm -hmm. and really take a hard look at whether that makes sense, or maybe I should work a few years, and then go back to it. And um, I think that's really, uh, really important. Uh, oh, can I add one other thing? Yeah, about sure. We were talking about what ideas of saving, and um, you know, if you don't have a lot of money. One thing, and I'm curious to get your reaction, is an experiment to use cash. Who uses cash? Oh, <laughs> OK. Mm -hmm. Using, great. Using cash is a great thing. And I know now you use Venmo. <laughs> Who uses Venmo? Wow. And or Apple Pay? A few. Um, research has shown that when we use cash, we are more frugal. We spend less than if we use plastic 
And we spend even more if we're using Venmo or we're using Apple Pay. And the idea is the transparency of the transaction results in how we think about the transaction. So for example, when I use cash, I they experience the pain of paying, <laughs> counting out the dollars, and it's sort of painful. You're like, oh, I'm get, giving away something. When we use plastic, it's a little easier. You know, you're swiping a card, but you still know it's a financial transaction. When we use Apple Pay now, it's like magic. It's like a magic wand. And we're seeing from research that, um, that people say after they use Apple Pay, they feel better about the store that they used it in. They think they're getting a discount. And I think it's sort of this, you know, we'll see more and more as research goes on, but using cash can give you a sense, even if it's an experiment for a week or a month, you will see what you're spending and you have a much better sense of it than if it's, you know, although you all were basically grown up using debit cards probably, but using cash, if you're, especially if you're having trouble uh, saving money, is something to keep in mind or do as an experiment. So, so gra d just back to graduate school a bit, and I appreciate yeah. uh, your comments, but one thing I do want to make sure students here all understand is that most PhD programs in really good universities are free. You get full stipend, full tuition. Wow. Uh, so, and, and I've heard students say, oh, I can't afford to get a PhD. That's actually one of the things you can afford to do. Ah. If, as, as long as there are really good, high quality programs, which Brown students don't have trouble getting into. So. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Master's, <laughs> master's programs, yeah. not so much. Yeah. Right. Or professional school. Right. Yeah. And is it really just like the top 20 colleges or top 30 or? It, it would be the top, you know, I think about uh, top, I would go 50 or 60. Oh, even. wow. Yeah, depending on the program. But that's something that, you know, if you do decide to apply to a PhD program, you can really shop, you know, what, what, are, your, what are your stipends? Is it guaranteed for every year I'm in the PhD program? What's the tuition reimbursement? Yeah. Things like that. But most of them are at Brown, they're free. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll go back for my English <laughs> PhD. <laughs> so do you, I want to open the floor to questions, but I was wondering, you did mention earlier, you know, sort of working with women in finance, and do you have any advice for women in the workplace that's different? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a fascinating time, and I think that, you know, for, for a lot of, a lot of reasons, but the gender pay, pay, gender pay gap is really real. Um, now there are more articles writing about the, basically the parenting penalty, which is really, in, in many cases, has been called the mothering penalty because women typically, not always, but are the ones to take off when you have a child and take care of a child or take care of an elderly relative. And those lost years of working means not only less pay to women, but also fewer raises and being out of the workplace and not getting the promotions. And so clearly that's one fundamental reason why women aren't paid as much as men. But uh, there was a study that came out that showed female grads today, so those of you who are graduating, earn 7% less than male graduates. And you think, oh, well, maybe is it that men do STEM more and maybe women are, but the, this study looked at men and women with the same degrees, the same majors, concentrators, and the same, um, what was the other one? Levels. Experience level, exactly. That say, oh, same jobs, same hours, same education. The exact same jobs, same hours, same degrees, that women are paid 7% less than men in this study right out of college. So that would be a pretty clear indication that there's some discrimination going on. And the more we pay attention to that, obviously that will make a difference. And also I've experienced myself and seen women tend to negotiate less. I'd be curious to hear your perspective, but I remember when I got my job at Money Magazine, I was working for Sylvia Porter and I got a call from my from this person from Money Magazine. He said, I want to make you an offer. You'll be a staff writer. I was so excited. Time Inc., how great. And he called and he said, $30,000. I'm like, great, that's wonderful. And then he called back again. He's like, you know what? This guy Landon Jones. He said, I'm sorry. 
you know, that's too little. I, you know, I, I, I want to give you more. And I'm like, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I mean, here I'm living in Queens with my parents. And what was I thinking? You know, I wanted to be agreeable and yeah. easy. And, and I realized that women don't, you know, it's a study show men negotiate four times more than women. So it's important to gather, you know, before you go for a job interview, look at Glassdoor, look at recruiting ads. If you know someone in the company you're applying to and you know them well, it's okay to ask them. Say, you know, well, what should I ask? Because I had a friend years later who um, came to Money Magazine. He, he was applying for a job at Money Magazine. And I said to him, he's like, of course, no stereotypes, but he's like a male, and he's like, how, how do I negotiate? How can I get more money? And I said, well, you know what? Honestly, ask for $10,000 more than whatever you have on your mind, because they're gonna, they want you, and I think you'll get it. And sure enough, he did. And so just be, you can't be obnoxious, you can't go, but you need to be, women need to have the confidence enough to know, look at what people are getting, and really do your research, and ask for it. And I think, you know, this is something your generation is so smart about. Men and women are smart about it. But I feel like you know we're, we're seeing such amazing change. Now, how do you and, feel? And we want to see that pay gap go away. <laughs> exactly. We really do. We it's do. It's crazy. No, I've observed the same thing, and both on the the kind of. I think every job I've been offered, it's like I've just said, okay. Right? Because I, mean, I want wow. the job and money shouldn't be important. Could you but, imagine but, President Paxson, yeah. brilliant economist, she goes, she's like, oh, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but I've also hired many, many people. And you do see the differences in negotiating oh. style. And you know what, what I try to do is I really look at, when we hire people at Brown, we look at you know comps. We look at what's the 25th, 50th, 75th percentile for the position, for the experience and try to make sure that we're being fair. Because right. what I've discovered is, if you hire somebody in a salary that's too low, they're gonna find out, mm. and they're not gonna be happy about right. it. And that's really not a good way to start a good, strong mm. employment relationship, so. Do you have advice for women? Like how to approach it differently, or? You know, I, I think what you said is exa exactly right, which is do research, try to talk to people who are in the industry, maybe even at different companies, mm. to get a sense of what it is. And then don't, you know, just don't be afraid of putting something out there that might get, they might say no, and you say, okay, well, I'll think about it, or I'm gonna take the job anyway, or I won't, but it's not personal, right? right? It's just, you put, out, you put out something and see what happens, so, yeah. Julia, do you have any other questions before we open it? No, I think you know we're at a good time where it seems yeah. like we can open up for questions. So, questions from the audience. Yes. Do we have microphones? To mm -hmm. Thank you, Hasmin. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Alexa, and I just wanted to thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm a senior, so thinking about financial literacy has been something extremely important. Um, and I want to start saving, but I often I'm confused about how much do I save? How do I set a realistic goal? Um, I think like the idea of automating is really like useful, but how do I know that the goal that I'm setting is like effective, especially if I'm not necessarily saving for a specific thing in mm. mind? Right. So do you mind if I ask you, do you, do you know what you'll be doing next year? Um. Yeah, so I'm going to be moving to New York next um, in July, and I'm going to be working at a financial bank. Ah. Wow, congratulations, that's amazing. Um, so, and you'll be, you have, you'll be living in, I could tell from your accent, you're not from New York. <laughs> you don't have a Queens accent. Um, and so do you, uh, do you know where you'll be living yet or do you have a place to live? I don't have a place to live, but I'm currently looking, using Street Easy and Xylo. Hopefully we'll find something soon. Great. Well, first I would say, probably you want to start off with a few roommates because you want to, rents, as I'm sure you're starting to see in New York, are very, very high. Um, and you know the old rule of thumb used to be, put a third of your income to rent. Now in New York, it could be you know, 60, 70% of your income to rent. So you really want to get that rent down low, and it probably has to do with a lot of sharing, you know, having, whether you build a temporary wall or whatever, having a smaller place. 
The goal is to save, I'd say, 15% of your take-home pay. So whatever your salary is, you say off the top, I'm going to put 15% into both the, either the, you know, 401k that you're going to get at your job, and chances are your company has a matching plan. For every dollar you put in, they'll put in a dollar or 50 cents. So that's free money. So you want to, number one is put as much as you can into the 401k, and then anything above that you want to put into the uh, savings account, the you know, high rate savings account that you can find on um, depositaccounts.com. But the goal is 15% is a good number to shoot for um, of your take home pay. So Beth, can I follow up on one thing? So we have people who are gonna be thinking about saving, but they're also thinking about paying off student loans. Mm -hmm. And I did something early in my life that I think was probably not a good idea, was to feel like the most important thing I could do was pay off my subsidized student loans as fast as possible when I could have earned more if I'd saved that money. So how do you think about people thinking, right. you want to make the student loan payments, but do you try to pay them off early or right. let them ride? So here's a, you know, a quick way to look at it, um, particularly for liberal arts majors. So <laughs> if you have, say, a credit card, and say you built up a little credit card uh, debt, and it's charging you a rate of 18%, paying off a credit card debt that's charging you 18% is the equivalent of earning 18% on your money. So that's a good deal. You want to pay off high rate credit card debt. If you have a 401k that offers matching, that means for every dollar you put in, they'll put, give it, put in a dollar. That's 100% return on your money, right? They put, you put in a dollar, they put it, that's 100% return. So priority is matching plan in a 401k, paying off high rate credit card debt, but your federal student loans are much lower interest rate. It's like 5%. So you have to say to yourself, is there somewhere I can earn about 5% on my money? And that's when it gets a little, you know, you want to put half of it in paying off your student loans. You never want to be late on your student loan payments, but then you could put the other half of it in savings. So it's just look at the numbers and pay off that high rate debt most quickly. Um, and it's, it's a feeling of, oh, I want to get out of the student loan debt, but that doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, you'd be much better off putting some of that money instead of paying off the low rate loans, putting it into a Roth a IRA or a 401k because you know your money will grow very quickly. And also, if you do public service, if you have a not for, if you're in the nonprofit sector or any kind of public service, there are loan forgiveness programs. Um, you want to be, this is really important, you want to be very careful that you follow the rules exactly as spelled out on um, the uh, website. I have the website here. It's, let's see, uh, oh, it's on student aid, um, dot, uh, student, sorry, studentloans.gov and search for public service loan forgiveness because it, it's been horrible this past year. Uh, only a few hundred people had their loans forgiven after 10 years of public service, even though they were promised it. So the rules are very tricky, but if you go into public service, absolutely make sure that you know how to document what you're doing so that 10 years from now, you can get all of your loans forgiven. If you can't make your payments, you could stretch out your payments and pay less each month. If you, you're out of work for a year, if you get sick, you can defer your student loan payments. So you don't want to just necessarily pay them off since the interest rate's so low, but you definitely want to pay attention. You don't just forget about them. Because student loans, if you don't pay them or if you, you can't even get rid of them if you declare bankruptcy, which no, no one here is going to do, but you want to be on top of it, but you're going to have them for a long time. I remember a pediatrician. I have three children. We went to the pediatrician, and he was probably in his like, late 40s, and he told me, yeah, I'm just about done with my medical school debt. I was like, wow, you know, but it is a way of life, and you, <laughs> he's like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to go to medical school. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it's, it's, it's just a payment that you're making, and as I explained, you know, going to school, even after you account for the loans and all the debt and the tuition, is people earn, you know, it's like $300,000 more than people who don't graduate for school. So it's a good investment, it's an important investment, but don't 
stress out about that one, especially federal student loans. Do not stress out about that. Other questions? Over here. Hi, my name's May, and I'm a senior this year at Brown. Uh, thank you again for coming to speak with us. Thank you. So four years ago, when I made the decision to come to Brown, that was a tough decision for my family as far as whether or not we could make it work financially. And since then, I always told myself that when I have kids in the future, I want them to be able to go to whatever college they want to go to and not worry about it. But college prices are increasing at insane rates. So when should we start saving for that? And how do we balance that with, say, like saving for our own retirements? Oh, what a great question. That's so thoughtful. And you're the person who uses cash, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like way ahead of the game. <laughs> um, that's a wonderful question. Um, and the answer is, when you, you're a young person and you get that first job, you start saving for your retirement. And you put the most you can into the 401k, maybe a Roth IRA. And then you want to build up as much as you can in your 20s. And then when you have kids, there are other kinds of savings plans, which I talk about in my book, 529 Plans, that also are tax-favored ways of saving for a kid's college. But it's more important to save for your own retirement than a kid's college because, first of all, kids can get financial aid that you got and I got. And also, um, you know, who knows what 20, 30 years from now it'll be like for schools. You know, there are all these things going on we, we don't know. But also, you can borrow for college. It's not easy, but you, can, you can't borrow for retirement. And, you know, you get to my age, and I'm very blessed because my parents, although they didn't have a lot, they were excellent savers. So they've been able to take care of themselves in, in their older age. And, and that's a gift to me because I'm you know, not as worried about them financially. So I think you should get that job. Do you have a job yet? Do you know what you're going to do? Great. Get that job. Save for yourself. And then once you have a child, you'll see these 529 plans. And then you could start to save for that. But focus on first your own savings and your own future. Good advice. <laughs> Any other questions? I know some students have 1 o'clock classes or classes that are starting. So please don't feel like you have to stay if you have a class to get to. But I'd love to take more questions if there are any. Especially someone here wants to get into medical school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hi, thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm a freshman interested in graduate school, and I was wondering about uh, whether I should save my money in a Roth IRA or just put it in a savings account, depending on the market. If I believe that's going to be a bear market, should I just put it in the savings account instead, or should I just put it in the Roth IRA just in case? Great question. If you're thinking of going to grad school, and if you have a little extra money, you're working, you have a little money for a Roth IRA, when you apply to grad school, colleges and grad schools don't look at your money in your Roth IRA. That's sort of protected and considered you know, off limits for the school. So if you're in that situation, you can do that. Put it in the Roth IRA because you know it won't be tapped by the grad school that you know, wants to get at that money to say, oh, you have, you have more than you, you know, in other words, if it were in a savings account, they would say, okay, you have to contribute that to grad school. This way it's protected. Um, so I would say put it in the Roth IRA. Yeah. Good question. There was another question, I think, another couple over here, right here. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Kevin. I wanted to thank you, Pre President Braxton, and um, thank you, Beth. Um, I have a question. What is your thoughts on refinance, like refinancing your student debts? to get like all your debt in one place? Great question. Um, with federal student loans, um, you can, well, my answer is don't refinance it to a private lender. There are all these tricky things that banks and lenders do which are really bad. And one thing they do is a bank will come along and say, oh, you can refinance all your federal student loans in a private, lo a private lender. Um, and that's bad because often, even if the initial rate of the lender is lower, the, it often can be variable. So they start with a low rate and then they pop up the rate. Whereas your federal student loans, if you have, uh, did you say you're a, a senior or? No, no, I'm actually a sophomore. Sophomore. 
So your loans are probably at 5%. Um, over time, when you graduate, you don't have to do anything now, but six months after you graduate, um, you can look at it and probably you can consolidate them all into one federal student loan, but don't go to an outside lender. If, you ha if somebody has private student loans, there is a way, so private student loans are ones that are offered by banks, and federal student loans are offered by the government. So if you have private student loans offered by banks, you can, and that's for relatively new, you can try to consolidate it and look for a lower rate. Um, I have the name of the place, if you want to come over afterwards, I could tell you, oh, it's privatestudentloans.guru. That's a place to go for private student loans. Oh, privatestudentloans.guru, G-U-R-U. -U. And it's just a resource of, they'll tell you where you can consolidate uh, your student loans to get a lower interest rate. But again, that's only for your private student loans. Does that make sense? Sure, great question. Savvy group. Uh, two more, great. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, so I was very lucky that an older family member of mine set up an UPMA account for my education. And also I'm very lucky that I haven't used all of it um, towards my education here at Brown. I'm a senior. I'm a senior. So there's still money left over in that account. Is that something that I should hold there? Because I've been told by my parents' financial planner that um, that could be used for like a home down payment or something like that in the future, or is that something that I should kind of roll over into a retirement account once I get a job? Right, good question. Um, is it, do you know if it's in a bank, it's probably in just a bank account? Is it like in a, or do you know what it's invested in? Or? I do not know. I mean, I think for now, since you're a senior and a lot is in flux, I would hold it there for now. Um, because to contribute to a retirement plan, it has to come out of earned income. And you know, so if you, the most you can put into a Roth IRA is $5,000. Um, it's quite a bit more at your company. So that has to be earned income. Um, but I would leave it there for now. You know, take a breath. You, do you have a job? Yes, yeah, so you're looking for a job. You'll find that great job. And you'll know it's there. You don't, I, I don't th the answer is you don't have to worry about it right now. Let it stay there. And then in a year from now, when you have this great job and you're already putting money in your company plan, then you could decide how you want to handle that. But using it as a down payment for a home or a security deposit to rent an apartment is a great, great use of it. One over here? Yeah. Hi, thank you for coming. I'm Nimish, a freshman. And I was wondering, once we graduate, if we have enough money to buy an apartment, would you recommend that we rent it or we buy it? And like, just more generally, how long should we rent before buying? Right. Um, another good question. Uh, so basically, the general rule of thumb is if you think you're going to live somewhere, say, for five, six, seven years or more, then it makes sense to buy. But generally speaking, when you're at this age, you might live in one city, then you move to another city. So renting often makes more sense. You know, you'll probably have a relative who says to you, oh, you're throwing money away by renting. And it sometimes can feel like that, because when you're renting, you're just paying money you know, month to month, and you don't own the place at the end. But the extra cost for buying, um, first of all, you have upfront fees and transaction co costs. And when you own a place of your own, you have to put money into repairs. And whereas if you're renting, often you have a landlord who takes care of those things generally. So if you're going to be there for a long time, then buying. But for the most part, the first, first few years out of college, you want to rent. Yeah, and I would add, you often don't know, you know, you may be single now, you may not be single in five years. So the apartment, the place that seems great for you now may be a little small. Right. Uh, so, you know, a lot of things can change Absolutely. in those five years besides moving cities. Right. right. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Ah, yes, two more. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sarah, I'm a senior, and I was wondering, I have a debit card and a credit card, but I've mostly just used the debit card. Um, when would you advise that I use the credit card? Great. That's great, because you use the debit card, you know you're taking money out of your account and you're you know, spending your own money. I would say, especially now if you're a senior, buy something on the credit card, 
something small, and then pay it off immediately, and that way you're building up your credit. So it doesn't really matter what you're spending your money on. Um, some people used to ask me, is it true you need to have debt in order to improve your credit score? And there was like a rumor going around, I think started by the credit card companies, you don't need to have carry a balance from month to month in order to get a good credit score. All you have to do is use it, pay for something, and then pay it back immediately. And you do that a few times over the next few months, and you're just building a good credit score. So even just like really small purchases? Small purchases is great. You know, really all they care about is paying, that's the, the number one, and in my book I have a whole list of what they care about. You know, they don't like it, say you have a credit card that has a thousand dollar limit, and if every time you use it you spend $999, that might be looked at, especially if you're carrying a balance, is negative, because it's like, ooh, that person's living to the top. So you, if you have your, I don't know what your limit is, is it like maybe $500 or a thousand dollars, then do half of that. Spend, you know, half of that for something and then pay it off immediately. Sure. And I think we have one more question. Right here. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for coming today. I'm a senior as well. I'm looking into jobs in the education nonprofit industries. Um, so I was wondering if you had any advice on how to enter the conversation when negotiating for salary at a place that doesn't usually have the money to, for wiggle room, <laughs> and then later down the road, how to negotiate for a raise. Right. Well, that's true. You know, not-for-profits are definitely struggling in many cases, but you're bringing your value and who you are and your amazing, you know, education, and so you have to think about yourself, you know, being mindful. You're not walking into a bank, you know, a banking job and saying, no, I want more. You know, but saying this is what, you know, ask around, look at what the average salary probably would be for someone starting out. Um, and be realistic. And at the end of the day, sometimes for jobs we absolutely love and want, they end up paying a little less. You know, popular jobs, not for profit jobs, end up, you know, a lot of people want those jobs. So you have to sort of think of those trade offs in your mind. But I would say, Educating yourself, um, and the same with salaries. You know, after a year, uh, cost of living indexes. You know, cost of living raises are hopefully what what goes on. In other words, you know, consumer prices go up every year. So at very least, companies you hope they give you two, three percent raise each year. Um, but when you go for that first review before you get, you know, your your paycheck or your raise for the next year, you can say, you know, this is what I've done, and be really concrete. You know, we took care of 100 clients before I came, now we take care of 200 clients, and I've, you know, worked up this project, or whatever it is. Um, being concrete and clear, and as Chris said, straightforward, I think is, is very important, and not, not, I mean, it's so lovely that you're thinking of, oh, they're struggling, and but, it's okay now for you to think of yourself and what you're after, and it may be they don't have enough money to meet what you think you need to live, but it's okay for you to ask for it. Sure. Do we have any other questions? Okay. I want to thank you for coming, thank and I hope you you're so glad much. you're back at Brown. Yeah, thank thanks. you.